Hello, this is Professor James Strickler, and this is a course in American government. This lesson is from Unit 5 about the Executive Branch, and it's Lesson 4 concerning the President's informal powers. In this lesson, you'll learn about the informal powers of the President, about the presidential honeymoon, about the power of persuasion, the bully pulpit, and the President's State of the Union address. Now, in previous lessons in this unit, you've learned about the assigned powers that the President has from the Constitution and extra constitutional powers of the President. In this lesson, we're discussing informal powers. And what we mean by that are powers that aren't legally enforceable, but are a result of personalities and relationships. In other words, people do what the President wants in a given case, not because there's some law ordering them to, but they feel compelled to because of the strength of the president's political position or his relationship to them. An example of this is the president informally proposing legislation. The United States Congress doesn't have to follow what the president suggests, but they may well follow what the president is asking for because of how personally popular he is. There's a time in the president's term in office when he's more likely to be popular than other times. That's called the presidential honeymoon period. The presidential honeymoon is the time period immediately after a president's elected when the public tends to rally around the president and give him the benefit of the doubt. Even voters that may have opposed the president during the election, now that he's been elected to be their president too, are oftentimes willing to uh, support him, at least for a time, to see what he'll actually do with the power he's been given. During that time when the public rallies around the president and he's at his likely most popular, Congress tends to be much more willing to follow the president's agenda. So historically, it's been a good opportunity for the president to try to get laws that he supports passed right at the beginning of his time in office. Now, I chose as the background picture for this slide a uh, photograph of George W. Bush taking the oath of office. He's an example of a president who didn't really get a honeymoon period at all because his, his election was so controversial. When he came into office, he didn't get the usual dramatic boosts that other presidents have received when they first became president. Another informal power of the president is called the power of persuasion. Uh, good example of a president who was very effective at this is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was an actor for a profession, and he used those skills as a politician, so much so that he was nicknamed the great communicator. So a president's power persuasion are oftentimes a function of the talents that he brings with him to office. Someone like Reagan was obviously very talented, but every president has at least some talent in this area. I mean, think about it. The president had to persuade many people to vote for him or her to become president. And so uh, power, the power of persuasion is something that should naturally come to a president. But in addition to the natural talents that they bring to the office, the office itself gives them opportunities. Essentially, the president of the United States can get an audience anytime, any place to then use the talents of persuasion on. So for that reason, the power of persuasion, this informal power, is perhaps the greatest power of a president, more so than vetoes or pardons or anything like that. If the president can persuade the people to support what the president wants done, then the people will push, persuade Congress to do it because Congress wants to keep the people happy in order to get reelected. So in that way, the president can use persuasion uh, to go over the head of Congress and get the public on his side to then convince Congress to be on his side. Or he can directly persuade members of Congress personally, again, using the talents of personality that he has to try to get them to do what he wants. A president that was particularly good at this power of persuasion was Teddy Roosevelt. And because of that, the power of persuasion is often associated with a particular phrase that he coined called the bully pulpit. Here's a quote where it references Roosevelt using this term. A person who wrote a book about Roosevelt quotes him as saying, 
to the author of the book, Yes, Haven, most of us enjoy preaching. Now, he's referring not to literally preaching, delivering a religious sermon, but the idea that politicians love to give speeches. And then he says, I've got such a bully pulpit. Now, of course, a pulpit refers to the place where a person preaches from. What that word bully means is uh, very good. It was President Roosevelt's own made-up word that he used for points of emphasis, sort of a substitute swear word you might think of it as. So rather than saying that he, he has an expletive good pulpit, he would say he has a bully pulpit. Well, that term caught on. And to this day, that, that uh, term, bully pulpit, is used to describe this uh, persuasive opportunity that the President of the United States has. A particular opportunity to exercise the bully pulpit comes when the President of the United States delivers what is known as the State of the Union Address. Once a year, the president is expected to report to Congress on how the country is doing. He's required to do this by the, well, it's a duty he's given by the United States Constitution. President George Washington did it by delivering an annual address to Congress. Now, eventually, after he left office and Thomas Jefferson became president, Thomas Jefferson stopped doing it. He thought it was too much like a king speaking to parliament. And so for about 100 years thereafter, presidents just submitted their annual report of how the country was doing to Congress in writing. But beginning with, the, with President Woodrow Wilson in the early 1900s, presidents began to again giving, give speeches to Congress to report on how the country was doing. And today, it's a giant annual event. The President of the United States uh, goes and speaks to a joint session of Congress, and it's broadcast on TV on many, many channels. On the night of the State of the Union dress, you can tune in and see the president speaking multiple places on the TV dial. What the president does with the State of the Union address to exercise his power persuasion is he only spends a brief time actually reporting on how the country's doing. And presidents almost always say that the country's doing wonderfully. And you can think about why that would be. The president, as the leader of the government, if he admitted the country was doing badly, that would reflect badly upon him as a leader. So he always says the country is doing well. And then he spends the bulk of his time, oftentimes an hour or more, talking about what he thinks the country should be doing in the future, trying to persuade the members of Congress to follow his agenda, trying to persuade the voters out there to follow it, and then convince Congress to follow it. So now let's review what we learned in this lesson about the informal powers of the president. Informal powers come from what source? Do they come from federal laws or constitutional passages or Supreme Court decisions? Or do they come from personalities and relationships? The correct answer is they come from personalities and relationships. That's why they're informal powers. They don't come from a court decision or the constitutional text or any law passed by Congress but merely from the force of the president's personality and how the president's able to use it in influencing other people. When is the honeymoon? Is it immediately after an election? Immediately after the president takes office? Or immediately after the first year of office? Or immediately after the president's re-election? The honeymoon is usually right after a president takes office. Now notice that's slightly different than the presidential election. Uh, the president is elected in November, but doesn't take office until January. So there's a few months in between. The honeymoon is after the president actually takes office. And that's probably a good thing, because it takes a few months for the voters who oppose the president during the election to then warm up to the president-elect and be supportive when that person actually takes office. What is probably the president's greatest power? Is it the pardon power? The power to call special sessions of Congress? the power to make recess appointments, or is it the power of persuasion? The power of persuasion is probably the great president's greatest power. It's how he gets the other branches of government to follow what he wants. What is the bully pulpit? Is it a medieval torture device? Is it the podium in the United States Senate? Is it the president forcing other branches to obey? Or is it the president always having an audience that will listen to him. It's the idea that the president can always gain an audience and then use his power of persuasion on them. 
So if you hear on the news, they talk about the president made use of the bully pulpit today. That means the president took advantage of the fact that he can get an audience to then give a speech to try to persuade them to do things that he wants done. What is the State of the Union address? Is it a yearly speech before Congress? Is it the location of the White House? Is it a speech given at the inauguration of the president? Or is it Congress's report to the president? The State of the Union Address is a yearly speech that the President gives to Congress, where he reports on the State of the Union, supposedly. That does it for this lesson. The next lesson in Unit 5 will be Lesson 5, about the expanding powers of the Presidency.